Uh, thank you so much for being here today. If you have a Bible, open it to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to spend some time in verse 10 and verse 11. I want to set this up to say that um, today's message is probably, no, it is certainly, a message that I've not given in the, the style of which I've not given in the nine plus years that I've been here. And in a sense, I think that the way that our ministry here is built, is probably built through a message like this. Um, part of the reason I say that is just my conviction about what God wants the church in America to be and what's needed at this point in time for us to get there. When I came here, I heard this stat over and over again that there were 176 churches in this small town. That's why it had the nickname Church City, right? The recent stat that comes out says there are about 140 churches now. So in nine years, we've lost about 36 churches. What that means is there is a merger going on of churches. Now, as believers leave one church, they, they go to another one. And it is important that everybody finds a church to, to uh, belong to. But I just want to remind you that the church is actually people, right? The, the uses in the New Testament talk about a, a gathering and a called out group, an assembly, but it's an assembly of people. It's, it's not a building. And Jesus makes this promise, I will build my church. And that word build, okay, is the word from which we get the idea of edification. There is a people building work that, that God is doing. And God chooses to do this work of building through the Holy Spirit, partnering with his people and putting gifts in his people that God wants to use to build his church. And there is this relationship then between the purpose of God, the, the plans of God, and the ministry and the activity of his people. What we're seeing in Holland with the number of churches declining, with mergers taking place, we're actually seeing it all across our nation. And one of the reasons, the primary reason that we started our family of churches was ultimately to prioritize mission in America just like we prioritize mission in the rest of the world. Because there are people growing up in our town, in our nation, who've never heard the name of Jesus, and we have a responsibility to make the name of Jesus known. And of course, God can do that on his own. A friend of mine who's spoken on this church, on the, on the stage, Les Isaacs, is an Antiguan pastor uh, from the, the West Indies, and he found Christ through having a revelation, a vision, while he was sitting at home. Nobody else was involved in that. But that's unique. That's not the norm. Most of the time, people are reached, people are built through God's people, doing what God's people were called to do. And so the question in today's message is, what are you doing? What are you doing? This nation needs people who are not simply faithful at their devotions. This nation needs a people who are faithful in using their grace gifts that have been unleashed in their life. What are you doing? We set this, this kind of season up in our church way back in 2019 where Steve Norman and I taught a series and we shared five principles that we believed would drive the church in America moving forward. And one of them was this, the healthy church of the future will be driven not by attendance growth, but by participation growth. The reality is, according to our survey, that only 20% of people who call this church home serve every week. 61% of people serve less than once a month. What are we doing? Now, sometimes people will answer that by saying, but Craig, uh, we're serving in our community, really. 16% of people are serving in our community every week, and 69% less than once a month or not at all. No, for most of us, we we've actually have the idea of serving as serving my family and my friends only. Let me tell you, in the Scripture, you don't serve your family and friends only, you serve them first. It's a requirement, it's an obligation to, to be Christ in your home. 
But that's not where serving stops. It's actually where it starts. It's not family only. It's family first. And for many of us, we have made our families idols because we see it as our only point of service. And parents, if you're here, I understand the tension that we face because we look at what's happening in the world, what's going on in education, and where we see all of these doctrines being infused into our kids' lives and we get anxious, and so we kind of coddle them up and make them safe. But have you not read Titus chapter 1 and Titus chapter 2? In Titus 1 and 2, the apostle Paul says to Titus as he's planting churches on the island of Crete, he says, do you not know that the safest place for the next generation to be is on the front lines? Because there they experience the protection of God, and there they experience the power of God. The safest place to be when the world goes the wrong way is actually on the front line serving Jesus. It's the safest place to be. But after COVID, many of us haven't done that. We know that attendance is slow coming back. It's slow coming back across churches across the country uh, simply because for most churches, those churches that made the political rights statements, they grew really well. We're going to see what happens to them over the next 24 months. But for most churches, slow coming back and attendance is even slower. What's interesting for us is we've seen an increase in the number of people participating in worship again, but it's still not what it used to be, and yet our total numbers are exactly the same. Why? Because there are about 15, 1,600 people, last week was 1,700 people engaging with us online. <laughs> Technology makes it possible for us to do things at a distance. And so what I'm speaking at today, I'm doing as a teacher who believes that God's Word is power in and of itself and that my primary responsibility is just to teach God's Word, but I'm also doing as a pastor concerned for the church, not just this church, but for Christ's church, especially the church in this nation. If we want the church to be healthy, then believers need to use the gifts that they've been given and unleash them. That's the best thing that we can do, not for God, but for ourselves and for the people that we love. And so the message is called Grace Unleashed, Superpowers for a Purpose. And I basically am talking to you as a pastor, as your pastor, concerned for you. And I believe that this text speaks to that. So again, if you have a Bible, open it to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. And uh, this is what Peter writes to the churches in Asia Minor, probably shortly before he died, mindful that the legacy of faith that he would leave would be lived out through the believers scattered across Asia Minor. And this is what he encourages them to do. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Five thoughts from this passage that Peter is trying to drive home. The first one is this. Peter says that every believer has supernatural superpowers that they must steward. Peter begins by saying, each of you, each of us has received a gift. That word gift is the word charis. We know it to be the word grace. But in this verse, it has the application, twofold application. Firstly, it speaks of a blessing that God has graciously bestowed on you. In other words, God has given you a grace gift. Since God has given it to you, its origin is supernatural. The second application of this word in this passage is that it speaks of a divine empowerment. This supernatural gift is divinely empowered, making it a superpower. You have a supernatural superpower that has been given to you by God. It is not yours, it's His. 
And that's why the idea is that you steward that supernatural superpower. The meaning of the word steward is to manage or to oversee someone else's possessions. So the passage begins with this encouragement to believers scattered across Asia Minor, experiencing hardship for their faith. The encouragement comes, you have been supernaturally given a superpower that you must steward because this is not yours. Even though it's natural to you, it is actually his, and that is a superpower given to you. So Peter says, use this gift. Now, the second thing he does in verse 10 is he talks about the difference between the focus of that gift and the motivation for the gift. He says, the focus of our stewardship is horizontal. The motivation for it is vertical. Peter says, listen, God has given a diverse group of people a diverse array of gifts that we need to use. So the focus of their use is on the people around us. But the motivation for such use is actually vertical. It's motivated by a desire to steward what God has given to us. There are two primary displays of serving. The first display of serving, the first type of serving, is the serving that actually honors us. It's about us. The second type of serving is the type of serving that brings glory to God. It's about Him. So there are two motivations for serving. First one, the serving that actually brings recognition and affirmation to us. And secondly, the type of serving that brings recognition and affirmation to God. Peter says the focus of our serving is horizontal, but he warns us not to make the motivation for our serving horizontal. He says it needs to be driven squarely from a relationship that we have with God. It's interesting, isn't it? Many people who don't serve say they don't serve because it doesn't suit where they're at in life right now. Other people will say, I don't serve because there's nothing really good for me in serving. Well, if that's you, I want to tell you you're a primary candidate to serve because actually there is nothing in serving that is supposed to be about you anyway. It's for him. The reason we serve is for him, not for us. So if you're not serving because you don't see anything in it for you, then you're actually a prime candidate to serve because the only reason to serve is for him. And if you're waiting for a time that suits you to serve, then you're waiting for the wrong thing. Serving is motivated by a desire to honor God with his gifts that he has given to us. It's not about us. It's about him. Unfortunately, we live in a world where that's not the messaging that we hear. The messaging that we hear over and over again is, if it's not good for you, don't do it. Now, there's some degree of truth to that, and I'll get to that at the end. Serving is good for us, but it's not the reason we do it. There's a European sports celebrity who recently walked out on his wife and two kids, and when he was asked about it, because he walked into a new relationship, says, listen, I've got what I am because I've always done what was important to me, and I'm not about to stop right now. See, it's very easy to live in a world where the messaging that comes in over and over again is, it's about you. It's about you. If it makes you happy, it's about you. But the motivation for stewardship is never about us. It's actually about him. Let me ask you, have you got people in your life who remind you that it's actually not about you? They don't do that in a way that puts you down. They do that in a way that makes sure that you focus on your vacation. I've got one of those people. It's my wife. She's my biggest supporter and she's my uh, biggest conscience too. The other day, Vipka went um, shopping and she needed some running shoes. 
And it's funny, if you came to our house in the garage, we've got this kind of shoe rack, and a lot of the shoes in there, they look really new. But apparently, if you run marathons and ultra marathons, your running shoes actually have a distance, a mileage on them. You know your tires are good for like 45,000 miles, while your running shoes are good for about 450. So if you run like 60 miles a week or whatever else you would do when she's in high training, after about six weeks, you need a new pair of shoes. They look really good but they're useless. So she goes out and she buys this pair of on clouds. Okay, if you don't know what they are, it's a Swiss company, and the shoes look really good. And, and when I put my hand inside, and we were there one time, I'm like, man, these things are not only look good, they actually feel good. And so I said to Vipka, I said, Vipka, I'd really love a pair of shoes like that. And she said, hold on. She said, we're not that type of couple. And I said, that type of couple? What type of couple? We're not the type of couple who wear the same pullovers, same T-shirts, <laughs> same shoes. Ain't going to happen. You're not buying a pair of white arm clubs. Okay, what happens if I bought gray? I thought about, okay, you can, you can kind of do that. So we were out walking in Sorgat that one Sunday afternoon, and, and there was a store in there, a store there. She said, oh, they would have them. Do you want to have a look there? I'm like, okay, she's into this. Let's go in. So we walked into the store, and it's pretty full. And true enough, they had this particular pair there. And I walked up to the counter and said, do you have a pair of these in 11 and a half in gray? And there were like uh, two college-age girls there, and the uh, store was full. And they were like, yeah, we do. And one of them went back. And then the other one really loudly said, oh, you're a celebrity around here, huh? And I kind of looked around, looking at who she was talking to, and she said, no, I'm talking to you. You're the pastor at Central. That's the big church, right? You're a celebrity around here, huh? And everybody kind of looks, and I'm, I hate that kind of stuff. We have a good conversation, and we go out of the, we go out of the store, and Dipka looks at me and said, Craig, let me just remind you, the only celebrities in the kingdom are the ones who are kind, compassionate, and lay their lives down in service for others. Get that out of your head right now. Do you hear me? It's really easy to actually think that if I'm not sent to stage, nothing actually works well. It's actually easy to think that it's about me. Do you know that the larger the church, the more the culture of the church focuses on the main person that leads it? I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, you're not as tall in real life as you are on the screen. If, if you're the center of anything, then the culture of that thing is going to make you look and maybe want to feel bigger than you actually are, more important than you actually are. It's subtle, but it's real. Peter says, God has given you a, a grace gift that you must steward. The focus of that stewardship is actually horizontal, but guess what happens? As you start to use that gift and minister to other people, they start to bring you into closer circle in your life. And if you're not careful, you can get off on how good that feels. We're going to talk about that later on. And all of a sudden, it actually, you would never say it like this, but on the inside, it actually becomes all about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And that's why Peter ends this text by basically saying, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. It's not Peter getting lost in like seventh heaven as he's writing the text. It's actually him reminding people that there is a subtle power when we serve that actually thinks that we are more important than we are. We're not. God can replace any of us as unique as we are to achieve his task whenever he wants to. It's not about us. It's actually about him. Now, if you have a look at verse 11 here, it, it kind of moves on and backwards at the same time. Verse 11, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides. So the third point here is Peter repeats this idea that the empowerment for serving is supernatural. 
He said we should serve with the strength that God provides. That word provides is used in that form only twice in the New Testament, here and by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1. If you know the Scriptures, you'll know that 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is actually the passage talking about the money that we give. Paul says that when we give sacrificially over and above, that God supernaturally provides for what we need. So what's true for giving is also true for serving. As we serve, God supplies the strength we need. Let me ask you, is one of the reasons why you don't serve because you think you're too weak to serve? It's one of the reasons you don't serve, because you feel too insecure to serve. It's one of the reasons that you don't serve, that despite the fact you have this incredible gifting, you, you find yourself being uncomfortable in a crowd. If, if, you, if you struggle for things like that, for reasons like that, then you are, again, a prime candidate to serve, because the promise here is that the empowerment for serving is always supernatural. And in fact, we get in trouble when we think we can do it without God. I'm mindful every time I speak that I cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing, the more you use your gift, the more comfortable it becomes. And the more comfortable it becomes, the less you concentrate on doing it. And the less you concentrate, the more you overlook those things that you should never miss. Think about the Scriptures. How many stories in the Scripture can be read in such a way that we should take from them that God wants us to rethink our understanding of how His strength works through our natural abilities. Let's take one example. Let's take the example of David and Goliath. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17, a story we all grew up with. So in, in this story, right, you have the idea that there is this Philistine army with this giant who is basically keeping God's people oppressed. And no matter what they do, they're just intimidated by Goliath. And up walks David, this young shepherd boy. He looks around. He sees the fear gripping God's people. And he says, you know what? I'll fight him. Now, I'll do it. At first, they think he's crazy. Then they think he's serious. And then they think, well, let's just give it a try. Do you remember what they do? Before David goes out with a sling, they actually dress him in Saul's armor, the weapons of the world. Hey, hey David, if you're going to fight this guy, you need the best armor that there is. You need the best tools that you can possibly get. And it says that they put the armor of Saul on David, and you know what happened? The kid was too weak. It was too heavy for him. And so they take the armor off him, and David says, that, look, there's one thing I'm good at. I'm good with a sling. See, God gave David the ability to be good with a sling. And so what we see is a weak shepherd boy who's gifted with a sling, picks up a stone, and frees a nation under oppression. The story is designed to make us reconsider how God's strength works with our abilities. And one of these stories, just this one, reminds us that the natural things that we do when we submit them to God can have a supernatural outcome. The key thing is we have to submit our natural strength, which is supernaturally given, but the more you use it, the more you think you control it, and the more you think you control it, the less supernaturally you will be used. Some of us are good at really, really great things, but the problem is we don't submit them. And so what Peter is saying here is, listen, God naturally provides us with supernatural gifts that the more we use them become natural to us. But just remember, just remember that you serve with the strength that God provides. 
In the next part of the verse, verse 11, Peter says this. He talks about, again, uh, the, the motivation for this, but he does it in a different way. In the second part of verse 11, he says, We do all of this so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. When we serve, Jesus is praised. Begs the question, what happens when we don't serve? The obvious answer is, if Jesus is praised when we served, we basically pause our praise when we don't serve. When we do not serve, we're pushing pause on our praise. I want to unpack this a little bit because I think this is where some of us get this wrong, even about praise and worship. We ask this question, why does God even need our praise? right? So, when we pause our praise, Scripture teaches that we hurt ourselves and we limit the ability of others to encounter God for themselves. So, Scripture teaches that when we pause our praise, it proves costly. Again, let's think about a number of Scriptures that address this, that talk about the consequence of pausing praise through a failure to fulfill our calling. Matthew 25, 14 through 30, there's a parable in there, the parable of the talents. Parables often talked about applying to money. It does apply to money, but it applies to gifts too. In this parable, a master entrusts servants with, with uh, talents before he goes on a journey. The master goes away for a long time, and while he's away, two of those servants put the talents that they have received to good use. But one of the servants decides to bury his talent. He does nothing with it. Then the master returns, and as the master returns, he rewards and affirms the two servants who put their talents to good use, and then he comes to the third servant who basically says, I was nervous and afraid. I, I couldn't do anything, so I basically buried the talent. Here, here's what you gave to me. I'm giving it back to you just as this. I've done nothing with it. What's the consequence of that for that servant? The consequence is he lost the little that he had, and he was thrown out into the darkness. This is talking about the implication and the application of believers' judgment, by the way. Believers' judgment is real. And at the believers' judgment, we will be asked to give an account for what we did with the things that we've been given. What we see here is there is a consequence to us, if not in this life, and I'll talk about that in a moment, then certainly in the next life through the doctrine of rewards when we do not steward the supernatural superpower that we've been given and put it to use. It is going to have a consequence. But it's not just eschatological either. It's actually in this life too. So, if you look at Mark 11, verses 12 through 14, 20 through 21, uh, we see Jesus walking by a fig tree that seems to be really fertile. There are lots of leaves on there. You look at this thing and you just think, wow, this, this fig tree is, is really good. It's doing what it was supposed to do. But Jesus notices that there, are, there is no fruit on this fig tree. And you remember what he did? He cursed it. Verse 20, 21, they come back through, the disciples notice that, there's no, that the fig tree is now withered away, and they ask the question, what's happened to this? And there's a symbolic statement being made here, that God had placed His people in the world for a purpose, and the purpose was not for themselves, their purpose was to be a light to the Gentiles, but despite all of the blessings and all of the apparent blessings that they were having, there was no fruit being produced, and God looked at them and was basically saying, hey, I'm moving on. Yet again, we see in this passage the same idea. It's the idea that when we do not praise God, we ultimately pause our praise and there's a consequence to it. Let's go into one more example of this. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, the Laodicean church. In the Laodicean church, we have a church that was criticized for being lukewarm, who is neither hot or cold in its service to God. Consequently, Jesus said, I am going to spew you, spit you out of my mouth. The lack 
of devotion in service led to their, of them having the risk of losing their status before God. This is really important, isn't it? How many times do we, incorrectly, emphasize how important it is for us to have a life that is devoted to God, and at the center of that is the reading of Scripture and the practice of prayer? But we make a grave mistake if the standard for faithfulness is private devotion, which does not require public expression. Jesus says you're in danger of losing your status before God. The privatization of the faith is not possible with such a public demonstration like the resurrection of Jesus. If you want to privatize faith that basically esteems you simply for deepening your relationship with Jesus, then the best place that you can go to live is actually the island of Patmos where the letter of Revelation was written. When I journeyed around the island of Patmos a number of years ago, um, I was having a conversation with, the, with one of the locals, and uh, they told me something that you don't often hear. The island of Patmos had a goal to have a church for open for every day of the week, every day of the year, right? So their goal was to have 365 churches on this island of Patmos, an ch open church for every day of the week. But they had so many churches that they decided to shift the goal. And the goal, he told me, was a church for every family. Church for every family. He thought it was a wonderful idea that at the back of the house, every family would have their own church. Now we have actually privatized the faith to the point where it's just for your family and that's good. There's no such thing as a private faith in the publicly resurrected Jesus. And so what we see here is, is this whole idea that there has to be this public out. We have the responsibility to serve, to express that private faith that we have. And when we pause our serving, it's like pausing our praising. This, this brings us into attention. There is the tension between the, the purpose of God and the responsibility that we have. Now, I've got a number of illustrations here, a number of metaphors or visuals that are usually used to kind of explore the relationship that you have with the local church. So one of the things we often hear is that the body of Christ is like a jigsaw puzzle where you and I are one unique part of that puzzle. And the idea is, if we do not bring our part into this puzzle that is the church, then there's something that is missing. And so the motivation often goes, hey, bring your part, otherwise the picture is incomplete, right? Another way that we hear the church portrayed is as the body of Christ. It's like a human body, and you play an important part in the body from 1 Corinthians, right, in spiritual gifts, about using your gift and enhancing the body. And the idea is if you don't bring your gift, then something in the body is missing. And that would be like the human body not functioning properly because a part of the body doesn't function well. And again, the idea is if you, if you don't do your part, then basically something in the body is missing. Some people will do it a different way. They'll, they'll basically talk about us being salt and light. You are the light of the world. This is a prison. And some of you may be able to see different kind of lights as the light hits it. It hits wavelengths in here of different lengths. Each length kind of beams a different color. That's the way the prism works. And so the idea is we are the light of the world. And if you don't bring yourself then what we have is we have light, but it's not as full and as vibrant as it should be. So bring your part, be the light, because if you don't, something is missing. Another illustration here is that the church is like a garden. 
And you are a unique plant in the garden. And if you don't bring your part to play in all of this, then basically there's something in the garden that's, not, that's missing. And it's not as diverse and as beautiful, appealing to so many people. And remember, Peter says about the gifts being diverse. It, it's not as diverse in this garden. So again, the point is bring your part. Other points in time, we see that the church is basically said to be an orchestra. Each of us is like an instrument in the orchestra, and when we bring our gifts, then the music, the harmony, the symphony that is played from, from all of us bringing our gifts is so incredible. And again, the idea is if you don't bring your gift, something is missing. On, on the one hand, all of that is true, right? But there's something that we need to realize. The church is so magnificent, it's like a one billion piece puzzle. The church of Jesus is so magnificent that there are billions of rays of light that are emanating from this thing. The, the point being this, the church is still going to be magnificent whether you play a part in it or not. How many of you have ever seen the movie Monsters? You know, the little kids' movie Monsters, right? In that movie, the, the idea is that these monsters need to scare the kids because fear actually empowers the monsterverse, right? So the idea that pastors often give you with all of these analogies is that your serving empowers God's church. Really? You think we're that important? God is no monster. He does not need your praise to feel good about himself. He does not need your praise to empower the kingdom. He doesn't need it. God is going to be just fine if you do absolutely nothing. So why do anything? How many of you have ever heard somebody say, what does God need our praise anyway? Is he some kind of, you know, egoist that basically gets off on our praise? No, God's going to be absolutely fine if you don't say anything. And in fact, if you don't say anything, the stones will cry out. So why, why, do, we, why, do, we do, any, why do we do it anyway? Again, the stories of Scripture actually reveals to us that praise is more about us than it is about God. And that the impact our praise has is more on other people than we would ever imagine. Just like there is an overlap between serving and giving, so there is an overlap in this text between serving and praising. When we praise God, we are impacted, we are transformed, we are changed. Think about two stories, Paul and Silas, two stories of Paul and Silas. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas are locked up in a Philippian jail cell. They're in this jail cell, and when everybody else is mo moaning, it comes to about midnight, and what are Paul and Silas doing? They're praising God. Then there is this earthquake, and what happens? The Philippian jailer, who is about to kill himself, actually doesn't do it. He's saved, his family is saved, and the church in Philippi is actually planted. So what was the impact of praise there? Do you think it impacted God at all? Yes, it did. Why? Because praise, like prayer, serving, like praise and prayer, is the tool that moves the hand of God. As Paul and Silas praised, what were they doing? They were acknowledging, as we did in the song, that even when things are terrible, God is still sovereign and I can trust him. What does that do when you're in the middle of a really terrible stretch and you can actually reach in in faith and say, you know what? God's got this and that means God's got me. 
What, what effect does that have? It blesses the heart of God, but there is a supernatural encouragement that is placed into your heart that words will never be able to describe. Praise changes us. But praise also impacts the people around us too. Just like prayer and praise are the tools that move the hand of God to impact other people, so serving is the tool that actually changes us and impacts other people. When we pause our praise, oh, God's going to be fine, but your faith is going to dry up. Your heart is going to become more like the heart of the world. It's going to be more about you. And that's a sad place to be. You know, I think that what God wants us to realize from this Acts 27 is another example of this, by the way. Paul and Silas on a boat in a storm. The crew throw everything over, trying to keep the boat, the boat afloat. But the boat, basically, they're in trouble. So what do Paul and Silas do? They praise. What happens when they praise? They just recognize that if Christ's in the boat, doesn't matter what happens. Right? Christ's in the boat, he's got this, changes their perspective. But then secondly, the impact of that was everyone else is saved. Go to Chronicles, Jehoshaphat. They're in a battle, they're losing. What does Jehoshaphat do? He actually praises God. What does that do? It calms his nerves to help him make great decisions, but it also means that everybody else is saved. Everybody else is victorious. See, our praise changes us and it changes and impacts other people. Serving does exactly the same thing. Serving is significant. And when we don't serve, we hurt ourselves, we limit other people's ability to be impacted by God, and the reason that serving is important is because it's connected to worship and mission. But don't let anybody ever use an illustration ever again that makes you feel that if you don't do your thing, then God's not going to be okay. Let me tell you, the church will always be okay. Why? Because there's only one church. There may have been 176 churches in, in Holland, now there's 140, but guess what? There's only one. <laughs> it's his. And all we need is one church to do the one church thing. It's all we need. Don't let anybody ever tell you that your serving is so important because if not, God won't be okay. God will be fine. But the point is if you don't serve, you won't. The serving actually changes you. Now, having said that, I want to end with this. I really believe we're in a season where we need to recognize that God has given us grace gifts that He wants to unleash for ourselves and also for the people around us, people who don't know Jesus and the people that do. And I honestly believe that when we do this, we will start to find purpose and vibrancy and joy and life in our faith because God will start working in us. But as that starts to happen, there is a danger that we have to be aware of, and that is this, serving is incredibly significant, but it is never supposed to be the foundation of our significance. How many of you have ever led a person to Christ? Hands up. How many of you have ever been blessed financially and you've blessed someone else financially? You have done that? Can you remember how that felt? I can still remember the first person I led to Christ. I can still remember the first person that God used Vipka and I to bless financially. Still remember that. See, when, when you serve, there is something that happens that you become a part of God working in other people's lives that brings you such an incredible blessing. I shared with you before how ministering in Europe, in, the, in Britain in the 1990s, there was a decade of evangelism, looking at the fact that the church was in decline. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Church of England, uh, basically um, pushed, we were all pushing, all the churches were pushing this decade of evangelism, and the Archbishop of Canterbury facing a, a pressure from liberals who didn't want faith to be pushed on anybody else, and from an Islamic community that didn't want to be evangelized, basically pushed back about the idea that evangelism needs to happen in the first place. Under pressure, the Archbishop of Canterbury stood up and basically said, I want to remind people that the decade of evangelism is about the spiritual renewal of the church. What was he basically saying? He's basically saying that evangelism, doing God's work, serving, blesses us. He's right. It is. 
It, it does. But it's not about us. That's not why we do it. It's actually about him. And it's about the, the truth of Jesus and who he is, that there's one way to the Father, and it's through him. But it blesses us. And here's the point. As you start to serve, that blessing that comes back from serving can actually become addictive. It can actually become too important. And when it becomes too important, we're on very dangerous territory. Because we will need that constant affirmation, that constant experience that will mean if God ever places you in an arena where there is little fruit, but he calls for faithfulness. Jeremiah, 40 years of ministry, not a single person responded to his message positively apart from his friend. 40 years of faithfulness with no affirmation, with no fruit. The problem when, is when we need that affirmation, as important and as great as it is, the problem is when we're in a season where this is about God pruning the church, are we going to be faithful then? If we need the affirmation, if we need the comeback, if we need the feedback, the positive, are we ever going to be faithful when it is difficult? The answer is unlikely. You know, I've never had to close many ministries in the church, but when I have, it's been interesting engaging with the people who struggled the most with the ministry closing. Now, let me say this. I've never closed a ministry in a church that's been bad. Churches don't typically have bad ministries. They have ministries that are being run badly, but the ministries are not bad. And so, as a pastor, the few times I've had to do this, I've never had to close a ministry that is a bad ministry. But what's interesting is when you do that, and there's been careful thought and deliberation about it, what is interesting is when you come up with those leaders who no matter what is said, who no matter how it is explained, they will never, ever think that this is the right thing to stop this thing. And I want to tell you, more often than not, it's because this ministry has become too important for their identity. Serving is significant. The, the, the feedback, the blessing that follows obedience is so powerful. But at the same time, the real blessing is not in our status as servants. The real blessing is in our status as saints. The real blessing comes when we recognize that we are children of God and that the overflow of that is serving. So our significance should never be found in our serving alone, in our vocation alone. But there is a blessing to it. There are personal blessings to serving. When you're passionate about your vacation, your calling, you gain a sense of purpose and satisfaction from it. When you identify strongly with your vacation, vocation, your motivation increases. You get up in the morning, you're just excited to go about life. The drive that fuels the achievement kicks in. Success that comes from it is just so life-giving. And you find yourself investing more joy, more time, more energy into this, and you find yourself kind of advancing, progressing in your career or in the area of your ministry, and it is really, really good. When you find something that you're passionate about, it's often the case that God will actually bless that. I met Vipka because I started to preach on the streets at Leicester Square with a group of people. I was pretty good at it. Somebody asked me to do it, and I prayed about it, and I'm like, yeah, I'll do this. So I go into the square, Leicester Square, start to preach uh, on the square, with Le uh, Leicester Square, with a friend of mine. Somebody saw us, asked us if we would go to a conference. It was at that conference, training thousands of people how to do street work, that I met my wife. But there is this, there is this kind of joy that came from that, because I was successful in this. I was fruitful in this, and ultimately, I started to increasing that. That's not bad but it can be dangerous because it would be possible for me to find my self-esteem, my self-worth in that. But our significance should never be found in our vocation alone, wrapping up with this. When our status as a vocational foundation, that overemphasis leads to the neglect of other important aspects of your life. 
And neglecting the other aspects of their important to your life results in a decline in your overall well-being. So if you ever experience a setback in your career, the moment when God said to me, Craig, I want you to stop doing all of these conferences. If you're not careful, that vocation-based identity will be disruptive and it will trigger an identity crisis. Focusing solely on your vocation may also make it harder to form meaningful relationships outside of work. When that happens, it also puts pressure on the relationships at home. It puts pressure on your friendships. It puts pressure on your families. It minimizes all of your hobbies and your personal interests. And all of a sudden, this relational imbalance starts to affect everything in your life. And then when you retire, your vocation-based identity is no longer applicable. You've got no job, no career to actually make you feel uh, acceptable. And that leads to feelings of loss, purposeless, purposelessness. You find yourself experiencing the difficulty of adjusting to a new phase of life. And soon, you find yourself lonely. And then you realize, despite all of your fame, all of your money, all of the accomplishments that you ever had, you've got it wrong, and you're desperately lonely. Listen, serving is significant. There is incredible rewards in it, but it is not the basis of our significance. You are significant apart from what you do, because God loves you, Christ died for you, and you are redeemed. That's it. But precisely because that's it, God has given you incredible grace gifts that He wants you to unleash. Because He wants other people to know what you know, to experience what you experience. And if you're here and you're not experiencing that, then maybe one of the reasons for that is that you have basically privatized your faith and made your internal devotion the height, the summit of your faith when it's just the starting point. Here's the ask, as I call the team back to the stage, as one song. This is the ask. On August 23rd, we're going to do a team night. It's actually going to be in the new chapel. It will be finished by then. And, and if you're someone who serves here, if you're someone who is interested in finding out how you can serve here, we want to invite you to that team night. It's going to be in the chapel. Secondly, as you leave here today, there are some blue tables, I believe, blue balloons, and even blue booths, which is a tongue twister, out in the lobby. We would encourage you, if you're just looking for a simple place to serve, then look there. Let me also say this. This is also a challenge I've given to our staff. We just recognize that some of you have gifts that go way further than we release you into. One of the reasons I do not speak every week is because I believe that God gives more than one public teaching gift to a church. He does. And it's not right for one person to monopolize what God has diversely distributed. But I also know this, there are others of you around here who are gifted in other areas that can positively impact our church if our staff would only allow you to serve that way. Let me give you one example. We started a Water's Edge committee where we put some business leaders onto a team to help us figure out what to do with our family of churches that has grown so quickly that we need to figure out what are we going to do. And I just recognize that there are people in our church who have done this for a living. They do this for a living. They got far more experience at this than I am. I have. And so we've already had two meetings. And I want to tell you, I walked away from the second meeting we had, and I was just like, praise Jesus. This is not something that I have to carry on my own. Thank you that you have placed gifted people. And thank you that we were smart enough to unleash their gifts within this body. So listen, this is a challenge that I'm giving to our staff. How are you bringing people in with gifts that can help take our ministry forward in areas that you can't because it's not your gift. Let me also say this. I say to people over and over again, I've always been part of small groups, but I never lead a small group. You know why? I am the best person to bring in if you want to close your small group in 30 days. <laughs> I have a public teaching gift. I'm not good in a small group, which is far more relational. 
right? And applicational. My wife is awesome. So when we're in a small group, Vipka would lead it because I would kill it. You don't have to be good at everything, I say to my staff, but you need to know what you're good at. And then you need to find other people who are good at the things you're not. That's the way the body is supposed to be. And that's the way we want to be because we believe that Jesus wants to build his church. And a part of building his church is building you. Building you to be more like Jesus Christ. But the responsibility as you become more like Christ is ultimately for you also to build into other people. There's a QR code there that you can look at. We'll leave it on the screen for a little bit afterwards that will just take you into places where you can volunteer to. Listen, God has given you grace gifts. Unleash those. I've asked the team to sing a song called Grace on Repeat. Pastor Travis used this song a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I love, love this song because it basically talks about the way that God wants to have his grace repeated. Now, the pastoral way that that works is that when we feel that there are areas in our life that basically don't match up, we can be thankful for God's grace. And every time we come to him and we repent and we confess, God just unleashes his grace on us over and over again. His grace on repeat. But there's another way that grace is on repeat. It's when you and I recognize that there are certain things that only we can do. And we say, okay, God, here I am. Use me. Let's be the type of church where that is the expression of our faith. Every time I come running, I find grace on me. You welcome me with open arms, no matter where I have been. And every time I surrender, every time I fall, I find grace more precious than I did before. I'm gonna lay. Grace. 
I will hope that you will carefully converse with God about what that grace gift is that he's given you and the ways that you can begin to magnify Christ in your life through your gifts. As Craig said, there are op opportunities for you to find out how you can do that here at Central, but continue that dialogue with the Spirit. Continue to dive into his truth of what it is that he uh, is trying to guide you in your life. And we invite you back again next week to join us at 9 and 1045. Be blessed until next week. We see you.